it's my very great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Stanley Kwan. Uh, the, the, the reason we're having this event today and uh, his niece, Ms. Nicole Kwan, um, and our distinguished panel. Uh, <laughs> I'll start not in order of necessary... Uh, just Ms. Ellen Yuan, head of the Asian Library, uh, Dr. Diana Larry, uh, the history professor, Professor Emerita, and uh, Professor Maurice Copithorn of uh, the, the Faculty of Law. Um, and I think the idea today is to have a, an introduction to the book um, and then to have a, a, a round table. Um, uh, and Diana Larry will be the moderator. Thank you very much, Alison, for arranging this uh, in what has been an incredibly busy few weeks of the year. Um, we're still all sort of reeling from, it's been absolutely wonderful, uh, but it has actually been very busy. But I'm so glad that in that busyness, we've got a session on Hong Kong, because Hong Kong has not only uh, been an enormously important part of the story of modern East Asia, but it's also been tremendously important to Canada. And I'm very happy to say that the person, one of the people who's going to speak on this panel, has had a major role in a formal sense in that because Morris Copperthorne used to be, uh, he would now be called the Consul General, but in his time he was called the Commissioner, the Canadian Commissioner in Hong Kong, at a very crucial period for Hong Kong in, uh, and Canada in terms of business and trade, and especially in terms of uh, immigration. And Nick, the person we're going to be talking about, the book that we're going to be talking about, is a memoir which to me, just in its title itself, sort of encapsulates Hong Kong. It's the dragon and the crown, the meeting of the two. Sometimes a very awkward meeting, sometimes an immensely valuable meeting, but especially in terms of business practice and in terms of how the economy of Hong Kong has worked, enormously important not just for Hong Kong, but also later on very, very much so for China. And one of the things that Hong Kong has done uh, through this strange combination of the dragon and the crown is that it developed institutions, financial institutions, uh, which are unparalleled. One of them, my favorite always, is um, the, in, uh, the ICAC, the Commission Against Corruption, which we're not going to be discussing today, but which is a model for almost uh, any place that one can imagine. But another one which we are going to be talking about is the Hang Seng Index. And I'm not going to say much more than that because I'm going to pass over to Nicole, who is um, the co-author of this book of memoirs, and she can tell us much more about it, except to say again that this has been such a key institution, and a key institution not just for Hong Kong, but now also a model, hopefully, for other stock exchanges and, stock and indexes in Asia. I won't mention Shanghai particularly, although I come under great pressure from a rather unwise friend of mine who keeps on telling me, you must invest in Shanghai. And I kept on saying, no, I'm not going to. It's not um, uh, open enough for me. It's not clear enough for me. And he keeps on reminding me of how much money I've lost <laughs> as a result of never having uh, put my pennies into Shanghai. If it was Hong Kong, it would be a different story. So look again at this book, which copies of which will be available at the back of the room afterwards and could be signed too, and think of what this has meant. The speakers are going to be in order on my right, Nicole Kwan, who's going to talk about the book and the content of the book. On my left, Eleanor Yun, who is a major historian of Hong Kong. She doesn't so call strange. herself that. It's not her job. But she really... Uh, yeah, I'm just a humble librarian. The, she's, the last thing she is is a, is a humble librarian. And Morris Copperthorne, who is both a professor of law 
a major expert on human rights, I didn't mention, but he has had a very long career working on uh, human rights issues. And as I said, when his previous um, life as a diplomat was the senior Canadian diplomat in Hong Kong in the, in the 1980s. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Nicole. Thank you, Dana. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming. Um, and I'd like to thank the uh, Central Chinese Research and the Institute of Asia Research for sponsoring the event. Uh, and for my fellow panelists in joining us today, uh, giving us a valuable time and the views on the book and the period that we're going to talk about. And a special note of thanks to Dan and Larry here, <laughs> without whom this book would not be possible. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> my uncle emigrated to uh, Toronto in 1984. And um, he, did, he doesn't like playing mahjong. He doesn't like shopping. Uh, so what did he end up doing? He ended up doing things that he's been doing for the, for the previous 20 or 30 years. He decided to write down his experiences. And that turned into a book. Well, he wrote in Chinese, and it turned into this book, which was published by the Joint Center for Asia-Pacific uh, Research in Toronto under the joint sponsor of uh, U of Toronto and York University, mm -hmm. uh, of which Dana Larry and Bernard Locke were the directors. So this, this was my uncle's first uh, publication, really. Oh, okay. <laughs> I haven't seen <laughs> that for a while. <laughs> so, um, and after that, uh, Dana and Bernard persuaded my uncle to keep on writing and this time in English, so that uh, his story can reach a broader audience. And then I emigrated to the U.S. in 2003, and we started working on this book together um, uh, over email. And this is sort of the miracle of uh, new technology, that uh, we, we could work on the same project in, in different places. So um, this is how... This book was uh, written and uh, it, it was published uh, at the end of last year. And essentially, well, what we've, when we were writing the book and after we finished the book, we, we couldn't decide what the title should be. We thought about it for a long time. And uh, actually, a, a British friend of mine oh. suggested the title. But he, he suggested The Crown and the Dragon. And we thought about it and I said, uh, no, 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 I don't think uh, the order is correct for the time we're in now. <laughs> right. So we turned, we, but we liked the idea and we turned it around. So it became the dragon and the crown. Um, and we, we liked the title for the following reasons. As we look back uh, at Hong Kong for the past uh, century, it really is a story of survival between two major powers um, with all the opportunities and all the problems that, that that combination brought and all the dramas and changes and, and um, all the growth were uh, as a result of, of um, the influences from China and, and Britain. The book is really divided into about five periods, I, have, uh, I can say. The first part is about old Hong Kong. It's the story of how um, my great-grandfather and my grandfather came to Hong Kong from uh, Lam Hoi in Guangdong province at the turn of the century and started their native banking business, the Yin Hao business in Hong Kong. And the first chapter is really about life in those days within the Chinese business community, which for those who know Hong Kong is confined to an area west of central in the Seung Wan area, um, bordered by Queen's Road and Dever Road. Um, and this is the area where, where Chinese merchants and Chinese banks um, <coughs> well, that make their living. And we also talked about traditional families. Um, we came from big families uh, on, on 
on all sides, um, and life in the in, in these traditional families. Um, and then subsequently, the second portion of the book is, is about the war, how Hong Kong people um, survived the war, and when, what some of them what, what some of them did during the war. My uncle and some of our relatives went back to the mainland. He joined the um, Nationalist <coughs> Army and then uh, returned to Hong Kong uh, after the war. And uh, then we talked about Hong Kong in a very critical period, which is 45 to 49. And it's a period where um, there were a lot of political activities. As you know, this is the period of the uh, civil war in China. Mm -hmm. And Hong Kong was really a, a divided society between those who supported the mainland and those who supported the nationalist government. And our family was very much, um, um, I guess, engulfed in, in this kind of conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, the Communist Party at that time was operating quite openly because uh, they had formed an alliance with the British during the Second World War. Uh, in the resistance against the Japanese, and they were allowed to operate quite uh, openly. Um, the, uh, the, the research that I did, I found out that there were at least 40 or 50 uh, cultural and art societies that were operated uh, by well, under the Communist Party. So you had uh, music academies, choirs, uh, writing groups, study groups, and so forth. And two of my younger uncles, um, one of them joined uh, a music academy to learn uh, about composing, uh, music composition, and another joined a choir, and both of them were eventually recruited uh, into the Communist Party. They went back to China in 1949 and have stayed there since. So this is a very... Uh, very turbulent period uh, for Hong Kong. Um, but subsequently, there were again, uh, as some of you may start to remember now, there, there, there is no loss for drama. Um, after 49, we had a period of um, where there were lots of refugees from the mainland. But that allowed Hong Kong to have to gather enough manpower to allow it to trans transition from a trading port to a manufacturing center. Um, and so there the book then covered a period where Hong Kong underwent many decades of growth that saw it transitioning from a trading port to a manufacturing center, eventually to a financial center uh, after China opened up in 1979. So uh, following this period of transition, then of course uh, we faced uh, the question of 1997 uh, when, the, um, when Hong Kong uh, was to return to Chinese sovereignty. And so towards the end of the book, we had a section where um, we looked at the various debates on um, patriotism, on uh, nationalism, immigration, um, and we followed uh, my uncle's footsteps um, and, and explore his decision to emigrate to Canada, uh, follow him to Toronto, and trace his experiences <coughs> in Toronto as an immigrant. So very briefly, this is uh, the span of the book, yes. and uh, I'll, I'll be most delighted to hear from Morris, uh, Dana, and, and Eleanor about um, their thoughts yeah. and uh, what they what they saw in it. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Nicole. It's absolutely fascinating because within one lifetime, you see these huge changes, almost unrecognizable changes. I felt rather sad last year. I went on the Sun Yat-sen Trail in Hong Kong, which is the, all the places where Sun Yat-sen was. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, not a single one is the original building because right. they've all uh, been, uh, over time, uh, given way to, uh, to, to much greater progress. But I thought uh, it's the trace, the footsteps are still there, and certainly Sun Yat-sen is still very much there. But to see Stanley Kwan sitting there 
who's lived from a tiny Hong Kong to now uh, this huge uh, metropolis, and also very fascinating, this, the over I call it not overseas Hong Kong, but all of the influence of Hong Kong spreading to Canada and to other countries to a lesser extent. Yeah. It's an incredible, incredible tra trajectory in one, in one lifetime. Eleanor, though, I think is going to talk to us about something different, right? Uh, yes, from, I'm, I'm, I'll be offering a librarian's perspective uh, on, on a book. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be part of a book launch. Lately, we, we had wonderful, wonderful book launches. Just last, last week, um, the uh, Long Yin Tai's uh, Great Ocean, Great River, Great Ocean, uh, the stories of 1949 brought over 1,200 people to UBC. Um, Winnie Chang, who's sitting here, is, is one of the organizers, a great success. And of course, before that, um, we had scars of war, the impact on warfare, of warfare on, the, um, on modern China. That's uh, Diana Levy's oh, work. <laughs> that was and, and those are, are very, very interesting and powerful um, titles on the impact of war on everyday people, of the common folks. And I think uh, what is this book uh, want to do is also giving a voice to people whose life, I'm quoting here, uh, whose life have been profoundly affected by the dramatic changes as Hong Kong transformed from an um, uh, entrepreneur to an international financial center and from a colony to become a part of China. And uh, as I read the book, I, I can see someone who grew up in Hong Kong and went through all the ups and downs, all the hardships, uh, bring himself back to China for a certain period of time and then coming back to, to Hong Kong to work and be so successful <laughs> and play such a um, pivotal part in the economy of Hong Kong and then uh, 1984 migrating to Canada. This is not the voice of a common uh, folk. <laughs> By far, it's, it's the voice of, uh, of uh, a, a mover and sticker of Hong Kong. But because of um, his family background, uh, Mr. Guan actually described um, in his book the stories of so many people living through the thick and thin of, of wartime and peacetime in Hong Kong and in China. And very, very moving stories, too. Um, I think when, when people talk about this book, many were so impressed was uh, the very engineer of the Hansen Index. Um, he, he established the Hong Kong Index, launched it. Um, great success is still one of the index that I have to look at every night on BBC. <laughs> 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 uh, but I, I think when I, when I look at the book, uh, I enjoy many other parts as well. Um, this book is a... a a blend of uh, clever analysis of economic development and fascinating social history. Um, it, it examines the identity issues uh, from a number of perspectives uh, to, to consider especially patriotism in the colonial days, uh, the survival and ultimately the success of the working class uh, as well as the professionals under the laissez-faire uh, system. Um, in the first uh, 30 pages of the book, I found that it's a, uh, I found a very powerful um, narrative of uh, the business, Ying Hao, the, the native uh, banks. So I did some looking up. <laughs> I looked up uh, some of the books, which I think uh, will give me um, the, the, the background of how Ying Hao or uh, Piu Ho, Nan Zhong, function in those days. And, and I found a very good book here, the, the development of banks in Shanghai and Hong Kong. And of course, Nicole um, sh showed me another title that I should look at. But here, if you're interested, you will find um, a very detailed description of um, the background, the, the history of early native banks in Hong Kong and Shanghai and where they are located, how they function, how they were actually intertwined closely with the um, major families in Hong Kong. So a lot of uh, uh, beautiful 
images, pictures, uh, as well as uh, uh, stories um, in Hong Kong as well, let's say in, in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. Wonderful book. Thank you. Do you want to pass it around in the audience sure, and yes. have to look at it? Yeah, just just to add to that, I don't know if I may on the on the sure, yes. on the in how um, my great grandfather. Uh, for those of you who, who may know Hong Kong, is uh, uh, was Deng Jingong, who's the father of Deng Xiaoping, um, and he the book talked about his coming to Hong Kong in 1870 and apprenticing in an in-house and eventually formed his own in-house and did a lot of the mortgages and actually purchased a lot of the properties in Hong Kong which make him a very rich man. But anyway, just, as, just an aside. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, as you can see, I have so many stickies here. <laughs> the sticky notes I'll show that, um, I, that so that I, I I'm particularly interested in those areas, and, um, and the uh, first one, of course, the, the in-how, the development of native banks in Hong Kong, and uh, the role played by the Tang family, uh, Deng Jingong, as mm -hmm. well as the, um, the Guan family. Mm -hmm. uh, the other uh, part that I'm particularly interested in and, and was very amazed by the excellent research that um, Stanley did was about uh, the war, the warfare in the 1930s. Um, I think he provided more than the background required to illustrate his role as an interpreter. Um, he provided uh, uh, the detailed description of the political situation there, um, the relationship between the nationalist government and um, the uh, CCP and how they uh, uh, how they pitch against each other and and uh, why translators were needed there and what kind of role they play um, and because he he was uh, one of the translators so he was able to tell us the in and outs of what the translators did and how they contribute to um, the the war turning of the tide of the war at that time. And that's uh, in the chapter, uh, Baptism by Fire. And the other part that I was very interested in was the story about how um, um, Man Gong, the, your elder brother, was involved uh, in persuading uh, the famous Cantonese opera singers, Hong Xin Lui and Sun Ma oh. Si <laughs> uh, from Hong Kong back to China. I think that's, uh, the details that you provide, tell us how um, entertainers and, um, and uh, young people who are, who are pay, um, compatriots were actually moved by um, patriotism, simply put, mm -hmm. to contribute whatever they can uh, to help with the building of the modern China. Mm -hmm. And of course, they were being let down, they were this illusion, and many of them suffered great hardship, just like your two brothers and a number of people who, who chose to remain in China. But um, the uh, inner struggle of these people before they decide to go back, they decide to come back or decide to not to come back, uh, those illustrate uh, the, 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 the mentality of those people in those times. Mm -hmm. um, which is shortly after the, um, the establishment of PRC, of course. Right, and, and if I may interject it again, um, I think nowadays Hong Kong, the Hong Kong government struggles with the question of, you know, how to make Hong Kong people more patriotic. Um, but if you look back at those times, there was no shortage of patriotism among the people in Hong Kong. And, and that uh, patriotism demonstrated at the time was not really a, a simple measure of patriotism that we we appreciate nowadays. Mm -hmm. It it was um, a place. It's an in between place. That's that's not a, my making. In between place or the hub is a as a phrase. Um, I think uh, first used by Elizabeth Sin. He, she always called. Uh, Hong Kong, the in-between place that people come and go for different reasons for at different period of time, um, 
and uh, in spite of their education, their family background, many people remain patriotic. And the um, other detail, um, the intimate details um, that um, Stanley provide to us after he established uh, the Hansen Index and went on actually work on the CPI Index at uh, the Census and Statistics Department. We had a chat in my office just now before <laughs> we came over. Um, I really enjoy a, a small measure of nostalgia when I, I, when I read that part. Um, the details that, that, that come before me really reminds me of my time at that time as, as the librarian that, at the Census and Statistics <laughs> and, and, um, in that year, actually, in 1974. I worked as a, uh, as a, research, a junior research librarian there. And of course, I didn't know um, Stanley uh, uh, at that time, but um, I have been working, I was working to support the research of the Census and Statistics. And the, under that commissioner, Wylek, that um, post was standing in a picture here. So this is a very powerful book to me, not only because it's uh, uh, a memoir and an um, autobiography by someone who plays such a pivotal role um, in the economic development of Hong Kong uh, up to the, since 1960s, but also because as a person growing up in Hong Kong, uh, it brought back so many memories. That's not all that I have to say about this book. But, um, we, we also want to show, I, I want also to show you a few pictures here. Um, that will tell you how people uh, live at that time. Uh, let me take this one to illustrate patriotism. This is donation by, you know, people on the street side, by Hong Kong Gong Wei Lun Hapui. That's a pro PLC. Uh, labor Union um, Association, and uh, they donate money to help victims, uh, front victims in China. So you can see um, how people will actually stand up and act, step up and act in times of crisis. And, when, um, when was that? This one um, must be in the 60s. Okay. I didn't bring uh, the footnotes, but I have a number of them. That's the first one that I want to show you. And the other one. Oh, wow. It's all poor people um, to, to look at a parade in the 60s in one of those um, housing estates. And you can see people popping out their head from the balcony of their little cubicle where they live. It's all full of people. And you even pass around and look at them. And this one, I think, is the uh, 1967 riots. Cars were overturned, and um, there was a curfew, uh, few people on the street, so 1967. <clears throat> Uh, the last two are the Diao Yue Tai protests, Bao Jiu Wan Dong. I think uh, Winnie <laughs> doesn't look familiar to you. <laughs> uh, um, there have been on and off um, protests against uh, the uh, issue of Diao Yue Tai um, by the student population as well as, well as people um, from, the, from different walks of society. These two. They're wonderful photographs, Ella. Right. And the last one, of course, <laughs> is the meeting between Margaret Thatcher and uh, Deng Xiaoping. <laughs> and that's the turn of the time for Hong Kong. Yes. So that's it. Oh, thank you very much. We've been joined by uh, Tom Chan, but, and who will speak soon. But first of all, I'm going to ask um, Morris Copperthorne, whom I always regard as the ultimate expert on Canada-Hong Kong relations, I actually met, he, Morris probably doesn't remember this, but I met him for the first time when I was on my way to Beijing and I had to 
um, meet, uh, sort of present my, get to know, I don't, familiarization they call it. I had to familiarize myself at least with the commissioner in Hong Kong. I got off at the wrong floor of the building, which was then in Hennessy Road. And to my astonishment, I was in a great huge crowd of people who were all uh, getting Hungry. immigrated. They were, they, no, they were patient. They, they were waiting for immigration. Mm -hmm. And there's this vast waiting room. I didn't know where to go, but I was quickly told I had to go up one floor higher. Uh, but it made an indelible impact on me because there were all these people waiting for uh, actually to leave Hong Kong and it was a very moving moment. But then I got upstairs and I met uh, Morris who was uh, and remains really the senior Canadian dealing with Hong Kong. So can I pass it over to you for a few comments, Morris? With that introduction, I don't know what I'm going to do. But, uh, <laughs> I have two... <laughs> preliminary thoughts. And the first is out of respect to our guest of honor, mm. and that is this morning I received a quarterly report from my financial uh, guardians, and they listed what had happened over the last quarter among all sorts of uh, <laughs> indicators, and one of them happened to be the uh, major world uh, exchanges. And there was Hang Seng, among the top ten in the world uh, in, in this particular, it's a very large company in, in Canada's view of indicators of the economic state of the various societies. Secondly, I can't possibly uh, compete with all those uh, photographs that you now have circulating, but I, I, I can tell you the one I wish I had and didn't have. Yes, and that was the photograph taken before the war of the boundary between Hong Kong and the New Territories. And this was an incredible photo. It had nobody in it. It had uh, what seemed to be a country road, uh, and then across the country road uh, was a, um, uh, what we say, like a two by four, which which came across the road like this, and there was a Y-shaped uh, like this to hold the pole at the other end. And there was a, a rope, or more likely a very strong piece of string, that when you came up there, you pulled the pole up and you went through. There was no sign of habitation, no sign of bureaucracy, no sign of anything. And that was the Hong Kong, uh, the, uh, the, the Hong Kong China, border in those days. It's quite an incredible realization of how easily people move back and forth that boundary in reflecting political trends both in China and, uh, and maybe in Hong Kong. And uh, I can never forget that vivid one. I um, want to talk a little bit about my own associations with Hong Kong. I was first in Hong Kong in 1955. I was a student in, at that time on a summer seminar in Japan and decided I'd got that far. Maybe this will be my only chance to see Hong Kong. So I found a plane that would actually take me there because in those days Cathay Pacific did not fly north of Hong Kong, only flew down to Singapore, Bangkok, and southern points. And I found this plane which operated out of an American air base. And it was an incredible experience. I enjoyed every minute of it. Um, and I think it's relevant that I was a bachelor in those days. Um, <laughs> a rock, um, and when you do, when I did end up going there, and several times this was in DC threes. DC three was a very popular aircraft. If you've seen them, they are very modest. I don't know whether any are still flying. But I, my subsequently in '59, my second visit to Hong Kong, a regular visit then. I was living in Vientiane, and the only way you got from Vientiane to Hong Kong was by a DC-3 run by Air Lao or who I don't know. Arriving in Hong Kong on a DC-3 in the early stages of a typhoon to the old Kai Tak airport was pretty exciting. I can tell you that uh, <laughs> my adrenaline or whatever it is runs when, when you're in that situation with people being sick all over, but you're enjoying the thrill of getting the plane down safely. Um, and 
I guess it was during the 59 time when I made several visits because I found a sort of 15th aunt or something like that <laughs> of mine uh, in, in Hong Kong. Uh, she was married to uh, an officer in the, uh, in the police force. Um, and she and her husband took me out to the Peninsula Veranda one time for a dinner uh, because I was actually living with them during this period. And in the course of the conversation, he said, we Europeans. And <laughs> that set me off because the last thing I considered myself was to be a European. Um, he couldn't understand it. I mean, I looked and acted. I didn't have the accent, but otherwise, I, as far as he was concerned, I was a European. I insisted I was born, raised, acculturated in North America, and we'd been doing this long enough in North America, whether he realized it or not, that we now consider it to be uh, North American more than anything else if you have to give your identity. I don't think he ever forgo forgave me for that little exercise. Um, Never invited back. Well, <laughs> I tell you, the, actually, when I think about it, the memory of those days is water rationing in Hong Kong. <laughs> I think you got it twice a week. You could fill your bathtub. Uh, well, it ran f for, for most of the day for in two days of the week, as I recall. I don't know. I do remember that I'd never lived in a country with water rationing before coming from Vancouver. And, it, and <laughs> this was a little bit of a shock to me to organize my life. Particularly, I used to have showers every morning. <laughs> you didn't in Hong Kong in those days because of the reservoir situation. Anyway, um, the next period I visited Hong Kong... Uh, after marriage, uh, was when we were stationed in Beijing during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, we were given a, a long weekend about every eight months to catch up on the way the rest of the world was, was behaving. Uh, one of my functions as the number two in the embassy was to inspect employees of the Canadian government uh, to justify their claim that they had to see a dentist in Hong Kong. <laughs> so they came to my office and I said, open your mouth. And, um, what could I say? Now, if I had tongue there, I would have yeah, said would something say, yeah. very intelligent. <laughs> so we sent all those people who had that particular problem down to Hong Kong. The, the attitude of the senior bureaucracy in Ottawa was that we were not going to force uh, them to undergo what were regarded as the... Um, uh, limited, shall we say, dental skills among the dentists who were available to us. And I, I do have to emphasize that was a very interesting time to be in China, in Beijing. There were four restaurants which, which we were allowed to go to in the whole city of Beijing. Well, that was just a challenge. I mean, how are you going to beat the system? So we had a little informal network. You'd phone somebody if you had run into an interesting new restaurant that wasn't on the list and you would then pass the message around. And that's the way you found out how he to get a permit to leave, to, to go outside of Beijing. Because we needed a security permit to go anywhere, even to go to, even to, go to the Great Wall, uh, Tianjin and all the rest, we needed a permit. And we needed, believe it or not, we needed a permit to leave the country. Uh, so we were well and truly encased in Beijing. Um, and we did pass around because the Chinese authorities never said that such and such a place is open. Uh, they just didn't answer you if you applied to go to a permit that wasn't, in fact, opened in their view. So you gave them about 10 days and then went on to the next idea and see if you could get a travel permit. Um, well, the word, as I said, spread very quickly when someone got a permit to Shanghai. We all put in to go to Shanghai. So this is the way you survive, but you had to survive. It was a bit of a game, and as I said, the restaurant situation was uh, a bit curious. Uh, one time we we were following a hot tip that such and such a restaurant w in the north of Beijing. I couldn't possibly tell you where it was, but it was far away where we should have been uh, officially. Uh, we found the restaurant. We walked in, and the place went silent. It went silent because the management's first responsibility to, was to phone the security that this, that this uh, Wycoran had showed up and what were family had showed up and what were they to do about it. They were doing their 
initial responsibility by phoning and reporting this crisis. Next, they had to be polite to us and they had to somehow feed us. So they, I don't think it ever had this challenge before. So they put us into a very clean storage room where, you know, the big rounds of the tops of the tables, they were stored there. They were very neat as though they were almost ready for us to come. And uh, we had our two sons at that time, and they found this all sort of interesting, lots of places to play and, and so on. And we were very well served. And... Uh, I could see now why this kitchen was, was uh, being recommended. And then we came out and we saw there were, when we were finished, and there were the uh, security police, and they didn't bother us. They just wanted to keep an eye on us, and we went out and got into our car. I don't intend to go farther, but I can say that almost once a week we would go out on this game to find a restaurant we weren't supposed to go to, uh, because often they were extremely good. Um, now... Um, so, we're living, uh, my family is living in Beijing, and we are uh, absolutely fascinated because we're living in the heart of a revolution. Uh, one thing that we did particularly value is the opportunity to send our children to a new invention in Beijing while we were there, and that was called the Chinese International School. Uh, the authorities had realized suddenly, be, uh, after all these people they've been luring to come in, press, businessman, more and more embassies, that uh, if there was not some schooling, A, they wouldn't come, or B, they'd establish their own school. And in those days, the, the, the view of schools, was of foreign schools, was as it was immediately after the revolution in 49, that it was doing, um, it, it was a dangerous venture. And so they created this school, and the school had two, it was quite close to where we lived, uh, and uh, in San Lee Tur, is that a good Beijing Tur. accent? Very hard errs. Anyway, they this this school had two buildings, so they decided to put the foreigners in one building, and the Chinese in the other building. But we had the same teachers, the same teaching material, and everything was in Chinese, including Laodong. Every Thursday, they had to go out and pull up grass. <laughs> and the foreign students and everybody else uh, participated in, in, in this exercise because, as you know, grass harbors, not snakes, grass harbors <laughs> mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, mosquitoes, that was it. And therefore, uh, grass <laughs> must be done away with. And um, the the... What the Chinese had done is clearly the most important thing. They'd found the very best teachers they could uh, who adapted to these children uh, having very little putungwa. Uh, but they were, no, this was the early years of primary school. Um, I've developed some theories out of that. At that age, the language that counted was the language on the playing ground. Now, there were only maybe two families out of maybe 30 families who had children in that school who were English speaking. The others were Swahili and, you know, all sorts of languages. And our kids just acquired as children do. They were, at that time, I think they were six and eight or nine. And they, they, they picked up enough Putonghua that they would have, I think, met the then standard that you had to have X characters by grade by by grade six enough to read the the uh, People's Daily. That was the that was the primary school uh, threshold, so to speak. Uh, it didn't last long, unfortunately. For children who can learn very quickly, they can also forget very quickly. We had a year after that in Boston, and uh, we sent out, we found a Saturday school to send to our children, which was run by Taiwanese. Uh, and all the teachers were Taiwanese, and of course it was it was Guo Yu they were talking about there, but in classical characters, whereas our children had been taught simplified characters. And there was uh, immediate problems here, and I finally had to go to the relatively young teacher, and as you know, the Taiwanese in those days, maybe less so now, viewed themselves as the defenders of Chinese culture. And, and anybody who used uh, simplified characters was not in their ambit of, of being 
uh, valid uh, person, a uh, Chinese, was not a Chinese speaker, was some strange... <laughs> Morris, uh, let, let me ask you this. Yeah. When you were in Beijing, yeah. was it the same time that uh, they tried, they surrounded the British embassy? No, that was a little them? earlier. When we got there in 70, we were there 72 to 74, mm -hmm. and this, you remember the Cultural Revolution is considered to run, and this is of course arbitrary and arguable, mm -hmm. from uh, 66 to 76. Right. And the worst was over by the time you were there. By the time we got okay. there, because that was a turning point. Mm. In fact, when the Red Guards mm -hmm. uh, surrounded the British embassy yeah. and tried to burn it down, Zhou Enlai stepped in, put an mm. end to all that nonsense, and eventually it affected Hong Kong mm -hmm. because he then decided that there were in enough violence mm -hmm. and bloodshed in mm -hmm. Hong Kong mm -hmm. that turn they that had off to too. end that, that turn off. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. Well, I can imagine that to be the case. We got to know Joe and Lai, actually. We were very fortunate in Because there were no end of foreign visitors. Every foreign visitor has to have a banquet in the Great Hall. And then he must give one in return. And so, and, and the whole diplomatic corps is summoned for this event. And um, they were, you know, they were happening two or three a week. Uh, those days. So this function quickly got delegated down one level to me. Mm -hmm. And we tended to get there promptly or a little bit early, and Zhou Enlai was the first of the Chinese side to come mm -hmm. into the sort of waiting area of, of, of the hall. Mm -hmm. And he always came over and talked with us. Um, so we have very high regard for him. Uh, of course, we, we didn't talk about politics or, or China, but we talked about all sorts of things, including his time in Europe as a, as a what, what do they call him? Worker? Student. Worker student? Worker study. Worker? Worker study. Study, worker, worker study. study. Um, now you've lost my train. Sorry. <laughs> um, and what, you, you were in Hong Kong when? Well, see, I've been in Hong Kong in and off the whole time, but when did we live in Hong Kong? When did we move yes. there? When did we declare Hong Kong our home? Was in 1963, uh, 83. We, we lived there from 83 to 86. Is that critical? Yes, it was interesting for other reasons, and I, I chose to go. But I wanted to say one thing about that was certainly evident to us living in China, and that is some categories of watch out. Uh, during times of political tension in China, clearly experienced that tension. Uh, and they were, they felt, immediately under suspicion. Now I'm talking about the watch I met from Indonesia and other parts of Southeast Asia, who said um, there was always this danger that there would be some tension, such as the Red Guard or whatever, in China. And they would be immediate suspects by certain groups within China, and so they went to ground whenever these, these incidents occurred. Um, and that, I guess, went on until the end of that 10-year period. Um, uh, we had to do something about these poor Canadians stranded in Beijing where they couldn't go down to the 9-11 or whatever it is where they could buy a steak to have on Saturday night because there were no such sources of food. We lived off the land, so to speak. And uh, we did have some shipments in, but to give you an idea what these were, there was one shipment of butter a year <laughs> from Denmark. And you could put in your order to one of these supply houses, and they only shipped it in the winter when the Trans-Siberian was cold enough so it didn't need to be refrigerated. <laughs> So that, mean as, that means that a Canadian family has to decide how much butter they're going to consume in the next 12 months before the next train happens. And we were all provided with um, deep freezes and all the rest. But there were a number of Canadians were not, who were not ready for this. They thought where they were going to a big city, New York, Paris, whatever, and that this wasn't the life they'd signed up for. I, a few had to be repatriated who just couldn't, couldn't take this. <laughs> Um, the only time it was really difficult, as anybody who has lived in Beijing knows, was during the end of the winter, when there was very little that was fresh in the market to buy. Um, and that's when most people, when you began to see those piles of 
let's say cabbages is a generic word, on balconies all over Beijing. Mm -hmm. uh, they were gradually going down during as the... As the winter passes. Yes, as the winter passes and into spring. But they always mm -hmm. made sure there was enough to get them through until the first crops, which were usually about May. Uh, and you were very conscious of the seasons be because your food was so closely associated uh, with it. But it was it was immensely important time. We're, we're asked frequently to come back to China. We always say we knew China in a very particular point of its history. How many people have the fortune of living, actually living in a revolution? And that is an experience we will never forget. Partly as an experience through our children, such as when we went to a restaurant on Sunday and I wouldn't get my tones right, and I would order horses instead of whatever else we were ordering. <laughs> and they were so embarrassed. <laughs> you can't imagine how embarrassed these poor children were that they had such idiotic parents who couldn't even get their, their, their four yeah, tones, let alone yeah. Cantonese. Nine tones. <laughs> um, so um, I went back to Hong Kong officially, so to speak, to, to be there during the negotiations for the reversion of Hong Kong to China. And uh, I actually volunteered for this because it was something I, I wanted to be uh, on the ground for. And I estimated that the position, I'm talking professionally now, the positions in uh, both Beijing and London wouldn't be nearly as interesting because um, the, the, it was about Hong Kong and if you were going to find somebody who would talk to you in confidence, of course, it's much more likely to be in, uh, in Hong Kong than either Beijing or, or London, and that's what turned out to be the case. We probably had the best contacts that were available on the Canadian uh, network. Um, one of the things that occurred during my time there was the question of Canada's uh, policy towards Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wrote a letter to the... Department of Foreign Affairs and asked, could I please be instructed as to what was Canada's official party policy towards Hong Kong? Well, they didn't have a clue. There wasn't such a thing <laughs> as an international policy towards Hong Kong. So I told them in writing that I could only assume that Canada's policy to Hong Kong was the least common denominator of its policy towards Beijing on the one hand and towards London on the other. That didn't arouse them at all. And so it was... but. I mean, you just have to, as I say, respond to these things. And a problem we had was there were always groups of parliamentarians coming through. Well, maybe once every two, one, six weeks or, or eight weeks, there would be a group. And they had always been scheduled to go and buy a new shirt or a new suit or whatever. But, I mean, this was totally ridiculous that we would have parliamentarians who were supposedly learning about the world who had been on a trip to China where it was all tourism, that they don't do anything. So I, off their official program, I had my own program, and I put them to work. And even in those days, the, the uh, Legislative Council was very active. And I arranged um, all morning, they had meetings with the, le the LegCo people much to their surprise and amazement <laughs> that, that there was a legislative element of Hong right. Kong because they assumed, yeah. of course, it was colonially run uh, and wouldn't have a LegCo that they mm -hmm. could relate to as legislators. And then they had to all show up at my residence at the end of the day to, to tell me what they had learned in this process. So this is another thing you have to do because the officials in Ottawa are so far behind all of this evolution that was going in Hong Kong, um, they didn't realize that an obvious interlocutor for Canadian politicians would be uh, LegCo and the others. Now, I, I've talked far too long. It's five o'clock. I want to... Um, there, were a, there were a few funny things. One day, the Australian High Commissioner, uh, Commissioner phoned me up and said uh, he'd instructions from Canberra that um, henceforth, uh, Hong, he, his title was to be Consul General. And so, I mean, we were still living in a colonial period. Um, and this was clearly very premature. We all knew where things were going, but you were supposed to keep your rank and, 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 and position in, in line until that actually happened. So I, I immediately had to tell Ottawa they should think about it. And, of course, they didn't. I, I, sometimes I didn't think they knew where Hong Kong was. <laughs> um, 
So I, I really must conclude, um, and even though there are a number of things I wanted to say more about uh, Hong Kong, I, I was fortunate in that I was involved as, as living in China at the time at the Prime Minister Trudeau's visit to Hong Kong in, to, to China in 1973. And out of that, of course, when there's a head of government meeting, there's got to be, be some payoff. There's got to be some fruit. There's got to be something or other. They can't yeah. be just seen to be having a social call. Some, it has to have some concrete product. And we knew what we wanted, and, I, and the Chinese seemed to want the same sorts of things. We wanted, among other things, a consular agreement. And we were the first Western country to have a consular agreement with the, the new China, so to speak, the, the uh, post-revolutionary, post-revolutionary, post-cultural revolution China that was coming. Um, I, and we did this at the end of the day, after all the, all the big banquets and dinners, then we would go and negotiate for a few hours. It was very, I felt very embarrassed because the Chinese was clearly under very strict regulations and I had virtually no, no um, second guessing at all. I, I, uh, I had got to know Trudeau over the years and I knew whatever rec I recommended to him he would sign. Um, one of the problems though, one of the real problems, was we tried to get in there a reference to the word immigrant. Immigration, anything, anything close. And that was the one sticking point. And it seemed that the officials, at least in that era, would not accept the idea that Chinese might want to leave China permanently. And so we finally settled on family reunification. So in the early days, uh, you will strange. find that, um, that uh, what's the right word? Uh, descri describer of, of the situation, which was fine for us because most of the cases we were dealing with in those early days uh, were um, family re reunification cases. But, that, but we had to have something like that in order for Canada to say we need an immigration person in, in Beijing or we need in Hong Kong he must be able to uh, go into Guangdong, for example, to process cases there. Um, and the Chinese proved to be totally flexible as long as they didn't have to sign a piece of paper that had the word immigration in it, or emigration in their case. Um, I uh, think I really am at the end now. But one other thing, I, I can't be the only person who doesn't present something to pass around. <laughs> this is a very interesting document, or, or replica thereof, and it's, uh, it's the weekly edition of the Times of London for Friday, June 17, 1898, which features the agreement on the new territories. Oh, and so you will see here how, well, the, you'll see their, their order of priorities. The first priority was West Africa. <laughs> the, <laughs> their, their next one was, quote, the Far East, Chinese concession to England. Now, I didn't, I didn't realize that the term England would be still <laughs> used at that time in 1898, but it is. Extension of Hong Kong. And they, this gets about that much space. And then that's about the same as South Africa gets. The biggest space on all of this spread, but well, except that Hong Kong has a map. It's, that's the only story. So you see the first official published map of Hong Kong with the new territories in it. The biggest space, otherwise, is Canada. The arrangement, the arrangement, what a nice word to describe a treaty. The arrangement between uh, Britain and the United States over the Canadian boundary in, in Alaska. We had at that point uh, uh, still a lot of unsettled boundaries, and obviously the Times of London thought we had accomplished something because the Canadian borders were always, rel at, those, at that era, were related to what else the British were doing all over the world, wherever they were running up against the Americans or some other power would then, it would be a trade-off. We didn't get what we got out of the goodness of their hearts. Um, oh, and the final element that has a certain contemporary relevance. 
um, they have a heading called The War. And it seems to be the Spanish-American War. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, subhead is Fighting at Guantanamo. Oh, there okay. we are. I, uh, I grew up in Hong Kong. I was born in Hong Kong in 1952. Grew up in a very small village that you see in the New Territories there. As in Sai Kung. Sai Kung. Yes. And um, you know, I used to be one of those kids that run around uh, uh, with no pens and you know, all this. Because in, in New Territories, nobody cares. There's not, not that many people. And the village that I grew up in, there's no, no water, no running water until I was... Um, Seven and no electricity, and it was sixteen. And uh, wow. I still, wow. I still, yeah, I still remember when I was uh, a young kid uh, to go to Kowloon. Go to Kowloon. We actually have to cross the military control points. And right after the war, there were actually ammunitions lying around in the street. The first English I learned, and at that time I didn't know what it was. The first. English words I learned was "Hello, come one one tala." <laughs> English, <laughs> English. Now, do you know what that? What that's I, new territory. <laughs> that's new territory. <laughs> what it was was when the uh, British Army they were doing drills and digging uh, trenches, and we often couldn't figure out why they're doing that. They take those big holes in the in the ground and uh, and then cover it up. They take them somewhere and then cover it up. And uh, little kids like us were uh, taught to, 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 to yell at the soldiers when they walked by, hello, come on, one tala. And then we got chocolates. So we thought, that was great. You know, that was good, good English. And, and that's the kind of uh, uh, memory I had uh, uh, when I was a young kid about uh, Europeans, foreigners. <laughs> <laughs> what, did you, what did it mean? To, what did it mean? Oh, what it is, is, hello, come on, a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a buck. <laughs> uh, well, just start uh, getting some something, right? So, village kids, there's no money, nothing, and the master days that that learned. Uh, but fast, and, and then and then, um, I, when, when during the uh, the riot, the Hong Kong riot in 1967, I was in high school. Still remember, there was no bus, and remember uh, in those days. People in, in Saigon, in villages, have to take bus, cross over the Feng or San, mm -hmm. and to uh, Kowloon to uh, attend high school. When there's no bus, we still want to go to school. So every day, my brother and I have to hike an hour and a half one way, <laughs> attend school, and then hike another hour and a half back home. And we, we did that, we did that for, for about, I forgot how long, maybe a month, maybe two. So, so for me to then read this book and to understand what's actually happening in the upper echelon, how people decide what's going to happen, is amazing. <laughs> it's just amazing. And, uh, and then fast forward to 1973, 74, after spending three years in Holland, uh, kind of bumping around looking for myself, I never found myself. Then. Uh, I went back to Hong Kong and I had perchance ended up working in a stock brokerage company that was the, uh, in the newest uh, stock exchange in Hong Kong. The, uh, 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 Gum, Gum, no, no, Gum, Gum is the old one. Uh, Hang San Gum, it's, uh, anyway, so, so uh, four of them. Yun Dong, Gao Long, Gao Long, it's Gao Long. I was in the Kowloon Stock Exchange, the newest one. <laughs> <laughs> and people who are in the stock market, the brokers really had no training and there's no high qualification. Anyone could be a stock broker. Moi, at that time, a high school <laughs> graduate, uh, had no understanding of stock brokerage. Uh, what the share? What's a share? I, I couldn't. I didn't even know what a share was. Uh, but I was a, a stock broker. I was a floor trader. And uh, I don't know if you, anyone still remember, those are the little guys, the little the guys, and mostly guys and some girls, that wear those vests. Mm, the vest. The vest with yeah. a number on the back. Yeah. And you run like crazy, go out to the board, and you say, okay, this is the number I want to buy. And you circle it, and you say, okay, five, five of this year. You run like hell back, and you phone up, and it was fun. <laughs> it was fun. And the Hang Seng Index, sir, I didn't know you created that <laughs> at the time. Uh, all I knew was that, uh, you know, 
10 o'clock in the morning, we bought up everything. 2 o'clock, we sold everything. And a young kid of 22 years old, 23 years old, I was making hundreds of thousands, well, thousands of dollars. Easy money. <laughs> and I thought, ah, this is easy money. That hadn't gone to heaven. It was so great. Yeah, I was, uh, at one point in time, I had about $600,000 Hong Kong dollars to my name. Now, this is 1973, late 73. What I didn't know was that everything that goes up, we're not coming down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, so then, then uh, I and then I went on on margin. And when it crashing down, and it was crashing down, didn't know, didn't know. I had no understanding of how margin works. <laughs> I still remember I tell you. Uh, you open a Hong Kong checking account at those days. You actually have to have reference. And my boss provide reference and guarantee for me to open the checking account. And so I have a checking account with the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank. Now they call themselves HSBC. In those days, they still call themselves Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank. They're still proud of the Hong Kong Shanghai Heritage. Not anymore. They call, they call themselves HSBC now. Um, so open the account. I wrote a check to my boss to pay for some stocks, 120,000 Hong Kong dollars. And... A week later, I got my statement. The 120000 was still there. Awesome. So I thought, this is good. Free money. So I spent that money, bought some more shares. Two months later, I was still downstairs and doing the trading. I got a phone call from my boss, Tony. Come on up. There were someone, some visitors here. It was the branch manager and two accountants. And he said, Mr. Chan, we found this check that you wrote. Two and a half months ago, we found it slipped in the door someplace, and we found it. And your account has no money. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? <laughs> so, so in those days, that's how banking worked in those days. And I'm not surprised to hear some of the banking, the bank runs in those days, because the accounting was not that great. But the long and short of it, though, is that the stock market crash, I got margin calls, and I lost every single dollar that I earned, including some of the money that I earned so in, in, in Hong Kong. I come together. <laughs> That's it. So I came here in 1974. In fact, I came here with about 110 bucks, and I spent my last hundred dollars in San Francisco looking for myself <laughs> again, which I never found. <laughs> <laughs> Reading this book, though, other than the uh, stories that you told, it, it was really, really uh, educational for me because growing up in Hong Kong, the story books and the uh, books that we, we, we read in, in, in Chinese are the uh, Gam Yong, mm-hmm. eh? and all those uh, crazy uh, martial arts stuff, or King Yu, which is love stories, or Sima Zhong Yun, which is all the Taiwan, the, the, the ghosts and the goblins and all that. And for me, to be able to read books like this, so I really have to, to commend the, um, the Royal Asia Society for bringing this kind of books to get to, to come out. Because to me, it, it is so educational. The, the way you write it, uh, Mr. Kwan, is that because you have, from my perspective reading it, is you're not trying to please anybody. You don't need to please anybody. You're faithful to the story. You're telling a story that we all want to learn. We all should know as, as this part of generation. Because we grew up in Hong Kong. No one ever explained to us how the Hong Kong society worked in those <coughs> days. Reading it made me understand. The other big part that made me understand is that how China worked in those days. Recently, I took a trip with my wife around the, the, the world and in, in about 107 days. It was a tremendous experience to see how different countries developed and how different countries can prosper or not prosper. All of that simply because of the path that the leaders choose for them. And you can see how China has evolved in the last 20 some odd years because the leaders choose a different path compared to when Mao Zedong choose a different path for their country. And I still think that we really need to do more in educate our leaders. Not only that, I think as citizens, we really need to do more. And that brings me to, to my last 
comment here is when I read the, 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 the sentence that you, you, you put in there is, you love your country, but does your country love you? I think that's, to me, the essence of this book, because it really tells me that you can have all the love you have for the country you love, but does the country love you in return? For a Chinese Canadian, for, for a, a Canadian of Chinese heritage, we have the same history here in this country. Chinese come to this country, helped build this country, built the railroad, but in 1923, or actually starting in 1885, when the railroad was done, this country said to Chinese and says, we don't need you anymore, you go home. We start charging head taxes. Until 1923, no Chinese were allowed to come in. And do you know that in 1901, census data shows that in BC, Chinese account for 9% of the population of British Columbia? In all those years, 2006, Chinese now account for 11%, only 2% increase. During the Second World War, Chinese could not vote. Chinese could not enlist to fight for this country. So people, Chinese Canadians who love this country, were not even allowed to serve for this country, yet they went anyways. And a lot of uh, veterans did it anyway. And they came back and they helped to get uh, Chinese Canadians and indeed many other uh, nationalities such as uh, the, the South Asians and also the First Nations people to get voting rights. And, sir, when you mentioned about Ms. Kwan, your family, your brothers went back to China, gave up their life, gave up prospects, and tried to serve their country and end up not getting what they want for. And then when I read, I had tears in my eyes when I read when, how you tried to throw yourself, the entire family, into this country when you came here. Now, this is the work I'm doing now. As success, that's what we do. We encourage people to participate fully in every aspect of life in this country. And what you've said in there really is something that I want to give to every new Canadian, every new immigrant to read, is that throw 150% of yourself into this country to take part in the democratic movement, to vote, and to participate fully in this, uh, 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 the, this, this country that's uh, so great to new immigrants and so embracing. So, love this book. I read it in one sitting. I don't have anything to give you or show you around. So, <laughs> that's it. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. You're absolutely right, Tong Chan Singh. This is, this is what actually happened. If you read either the history of Hong Kong from the British perspective, it's one of the most boring books I've ever read. I'm probably one of the few people who has read it, and I can't even remember the author's name. Uh, the, History of Hong Kong written from the mainland, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, also, not recently, but in the past, just absolutely dreadfully boring. And in between, actually working in Hong Kong, a very few really, really good historians, but who've had a terribly difficult time getting anything published, but here it is. So afterwards, again, any of you who want to buy it, but in the meantime, let's have some comments from the audience, especially from several people I can see who are also from Hong Kong. And uh, we all have this, talking about Hong Kong, this great difficulty with nostalgia. Um, it's almost so, everybody who spent time there, I think, uh, is deeply drawn and involved with it. And little things bring you these great sort of surges of nostalgia. When Eleanor talked about Kai Tak, I thought, I miss it so much because there's no place in the world that it was nicer to arrive. You know, you <laughs> yeah. came in at the top and you and looked around at the yeah. sea of faces and there would be your friends and you, you felt like royalty or something. And now you come out and you can't find anybody because you come out into right. this huge concourse and you have to, I'm the only one without a cell phone. Everybody else is finding their friends by cell phone. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Where are you? <laughs> Whereas before, this wonderful entry at the yes. top of this magnificent ramp, and I don't know why they didn't um, uh, replicate that at the new airport, but to me it's, um, it's a lost opportunities. <laughs> I, I lived uh, for a while uh, with my, uh, my then fiancé in Kowloon City, and I still remember it. The plane coming down, mm -hmm. we could we went up to the top of the flat. We could touch the uh, the yes. plane, 
and the noise that they created, and it's just, just so loud. And now I live in Richmond, hearing people in Richmond complain about the noise. Well, that's your problem. <laughs> he doesn't learn. <laughs> Have we got some comments from the audience, David? Yeah, I, oh, so stand yeah. here. Sorry. Respond to the panel. The first thing I think I want to say is my amazement for so many coincidences. In response to your remarks, I've said, you said something, I love my country, mm -hmm. love my country, love me, yeah. right? Yes. Now, I got end up quotation there. Yes. Uh, you said, I think, yes, page 174 of him. The time when I pick up and ready to emigrate to, to Canada, my patriotic friends told me, well, Hong Kong is far to come about China. You stay in Hong Kong and serve your mother country. Mm -hmm. Well, I thank you. Thank you very much. But I will tell you something. So I cook. It is not that I do not love Hong Kong and China, mm -hmm. but that I value freedom and democracy more. So I say bye-bye. This is how I came here. You can find it on... Yes. David Choi, another pastor from Hong Kong. I, I, uh, I was born oh, and grew up in Hong Kong and in Canada. I haven't mm -hmm. read the book, but I will. I think it's important to capture uh, the history. Mm -hmm. And uh, from what I hear, you know, talk about the crucial aspect, the changes in Hong Kong, political changes, and also the economic changes. So I have two questions I'd like to ask uh, Stanley and Nicole. Mm -hmm. As someone who understands the formation uh, of the Hang Seng Index and the, how it, the four ex stock exchanges evolved into one, do you agree with the current composition of the Hang Seng Index? Are there things that you, from what you see today, that you would like to improve and would you see the future direction? Now, the second, the second question is this. It seems like you also very much understand how the financial system evolved in Hong Kong, from the Ngan Dim, all the way to the banks and then the foreign banks, international financial center, and so on. And I assume you have traveled to, to China. Mm -hmm. um, so in China right now, it is also evolving very rapidly. And from what you see in Hong Kong and about capital formation, you know, entrepreneurship. And in those days, the money, besides coming from the banks, is from relatives and friends and so on. And this is where entrepreneurship should flourish. Mm -hmm. And very, in, in similar ways, this is happening in a, in a great deal in China right now. So I don't know what parts of China and, and to what extent you've traveled in China, so I'd be interested to know your insights from what you see, what you have seen in Hong Kong and what's happening in China now, where entrepreneurship is flourishing. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the private sector is really rising very quickly. And if you have insights to share with us, because there are similarities and dissimilarities between Hong Kong and China, where the private sector is growing, and what, what do you see happening in China, where do you think is going in that sector and how that may evolve? Mm -hmm. Well, let me answer the, your questions one by one. Just to bring them. First of all, about the index. Uh, prior, prior to the creation of the index, there was no index in Hong Kong. So we were the first one to have an index. And eventually, there were four, say, five, four. <laughs> you yes, that's right. Four sort of kings Hong Kong. Yeah. So each so I said, what the, their own index. That's right. Yeah. But no, nobody would do it. And they just <coughs> follow, follow the formula of an index. So when the four exchanges emerged, and the head of the, uh, what do you call it, director or lays you, what do you call it? Yeah. yeah. How come this is a Hong Kong so exchange? <coughs> Why should we have a Hang Seng index instead? So the device, the Hong Kong index, 
in the first few months, well, maybe a couple of years, I don't know, only a few months, I guess, both indexes, they publish in the press. But somehow I eventually, I don't understand, because the Hanan Sen index was so deep rooted in the heart of Hong Kong people. They only, they only talk about the Hanan index. They never referred to, to the Hong Kong index. One more thing I should tell you about, about, about the, when you make, make a lot of money yeah. and loss. Yeah, that's right. Loss it all. No. Yeah. There's a time, there's a the saying, you Yeah, yeah, that's it. You have your life. <laughs> you just not look poor or fish. Yeah. You shark's feet. That was me. I told you you're okay. It's <laughs> 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 very expensive. <laughs> the, the, the brokers. Oh, it's going to be zero. Yeah, I was eating my egg. Ten cents. Ten cents. It is a hundred dollars, right? Because it's one thousand shares per lot. So a dollar is a thousand dollars. So so spend a hundred bucks or so is a, is ten, ten cents. So what's the point? Oh, yeah, don't worry, <laughs> just spend and be happy. <laughs> yeah, man, <you're> coming. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Well, let me let me add to that. Um, with regard to David's uh, question about the the current index, now obviously it's been 40 years. In fact, uh, I forgot to mention that, but the Hangzhou index was launched on November 24, 1969. So this year is the 40th anniversary. Right. Uh, since then, the index has always evolved, uh, evolved uh, considerably, and now has many sub indexes. I think a lot of the uh, reason for that is because um, right now I think the Hong Kong stock market is very, un is very much influenced by capital from the mainland and, and very much influenced by mainland companies raising funds in Hong Kong. So one of the most often used in sub-indices within the Hang Seng Index is, uh, would be mainland shares, the key mainland shares. And this has sort of taken over, I think, the, the uh, sort of the heavy weight of the index these days. You know, aside from real estate companies, mm. we have the mainland shares, who, which are, you know, uh, yeah. the major players uh, right. within Actually, the market. The way the index com is computed is against our original ideas. Mm. When we set the index, we only allow Hong Kong based companies to be selected as the components of the index. But now, if you look for the list of components of the index, there are Hong Kong companies and many companies. Yeah. Some big, big uh, corporations in China yeah. could be uh, listed in Hong Kong. The risk capital and everything. Yeah. So I think in, in recent years, <coughs> more mainland companies have listed in Hong Kong than local companies. Oh yeah, that, that's, that's for sure, that's the general trend. And with regard to your question about um, Chinese local entrepreneurs financing themselves, in the days of the in-house, uh, you're right in the sense that it's, the financing is done by, mostly done by people in the neighborhood, people within the same village, or people within the same county. So our family is from Gao Gong, which is a county, Lam uh, Hoi, uh, south of Guangzhou. And the Gaogong clan um, operated in how sort of the world over. In fact, we had uh, a lot of network that goes all, that went all the way to Havana, San Francisco, uh, Mexico. Um, and, and it, was a, it was a very wide network. And we mainly, you know, and, and there was a lot of support within the clan for the businesses um, uh, that the, the clan handled. Um, right now, I think when, when you uh, asked about uh, private enterprises in China, uh, I think you hit up, upon a very um, <coughs> big issue in China, which is that private enterprises actually do not get a lot of funding from the state banks. State banks mainly support state enterprises. Um, and private enterprises have to get their money from 
a lot of, I would have to say, uh, very much underground sources. They had Qin Zhong. Um, were, in fact, a large amount of financing in China is not accounted for by official statistics. A lot of it is within the region, within the uh, you know, cities, villages, and so on and so forth. Um, and and this, is a, this is a problem that I think China will have to sort out eventually. Because uh, as we see now with the huge stimulus package that China launched earlier this year, it's the state enterprises who have been benefiting. Um, and uh, the, the more private uh, sectors, uh, in fact, have been starved for, for financing. So this is, a, this is an area that is not resolved, but um, will create problems because uh, the private enterprises, in fact, ironically, is the sector that generates employment, particularly the export industries uh, along the coast. Well, the Hansen Bank actually started as a Yin Hao, as yeah. a um, Hansen Yin Hao in uh, 1933. And at that time, I think uh, um, many of those Yin Hao flourished in Hong Kong just because of the remittance, the influx of remittance all over the world right. through Hong Kong to um, the southern China. Uh, and, and that's the kind of very unique role that Hong Kong has been playing in the financial market right. yeah, since those very days. Yeah. Hong yeah. Kong was the center of overseas Chinese. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a hop. Yeah. If I could throw some other evidence of that, uh, Hong Kong has Canada's first uh, government representative in all of Asia. It was a, uh, a person who was actually an employee of the CPR, but in fact was seconded to the government, and he served as immigrant visa officer. Winnie, and I think this will have to be almost the last, because I want to give some time for people who might want books and can have them signed by Stanley. Thank you. Okay, I will be very brief. First, um, my father-in-law actually worked in one of the Yinghao, oh. I think he is a part owner. Um, they're from Taiping. Taiping. But talking to him, I couldn't get a lot of understanding how they operate. So I'm looking forward to reading your book. And I'm looking forward to reading your book also because of my mother's own experience uh, when I was doing some research to verify the story she wrote about her own time as a child refugee coming into Hong Kong and going off Hong Kong. I realized how important it is to have the worm's eye view, as well as the bird's eye view. Uh, Diana talks about coming to Hong Kong and seeing Hong Kong as a bird, right? And I had the worm's eye view of the Kai Tak Airport when I was an infant. Often in the evening, my father would carry me on his shoulders, and we went out to Taula because it's so hot in the summertime. And so I had the worm's eye view. When my mother was talking about her experience as a child, when the Japanese occupied Hong Kong, she described how people were encouraged by the Japanese who was running Hong Kong to return to China because of starvation that right. took place that happened in Hong Kong. But she could not explain why the government, the Japanese government, would allow them to go freely back to China. So when I was doing my research, I had to be able to find the answer by reading David Lamb's a biography, where he was uh, a, maybe a, a late teenager or early 20 year old, and he was asked to do something about, um, well, because of his family background, he would have a better understanding of what's going on in Hong Kong. So the answer I got from his account was that because there was no food in Hong Kong, not enough mm -hmm. supply, so therefore instead of having people die in Hong Kong, the Japanese encourage people to go back so that it's not their problem to go back to China. Mm -hmm. So what I want to say here is I really look forward to reading your book because as one of the people have to shape the society, um, you have influence. So as someone who grew up in Hong Kong, was born in Hong Kong, there were a lot of experiences which would be revisited in a very new light when I could understand from a different perspective how new things actually happen. So thank you, I, I, I would definitely... One of the ideas <laughs> of my wedding piece book is try to link all, all Hong Kong 
I'm friend Mito. Jim. And, and his brothers. Uh, yeah, I, I have heard that she read the book. She has it in English. She wrote it in Chinese. Like Tom. So there's an English version. <laughs> I had, I had the opportunity to read the book, and like Tom, I, um, I read in one sitting, yeah. because it was just down. so <laughs> fascinating, yeah. because it, it, it filled in all the gaps, and it connected the dots in, in my family, in my family's life, because my father, uh, as a young man, came from the village uh, to Hong Kong to make his fortune, and this was pre-war, and, um, <laughs> you know, during the time that he was in Hong Kong, he managed to get into Western Pharmacy. And during the war, when, uh, when the Japanese had taken over to Hong Kong, uh, a, a bottle of penicillin, you could buy it, you could trade it for an entire building. You know, that was how precious this was. And he was loaded. And apparently, uh, you know, I, there was this <coughs> story that, that when, <coughs> I think I was, uh, I was uh, supposed to be a, uh, a New Year's baby, and it was not supposed to be a good thing, so they actually, you know, yanked me out before, uh, <laughs> so I was born actually five hours before New Year's, because my mom keeps saying, you know, he, she heard the, the firecrackers, so I was, you know, and she has a big scar to, to prove it, but anyways, what happened to my father was that uh, he didn't figure that the Japanese would leave, so he kept all his money in Japanese military. Oh no! Yeah. So by the time the war ended, he was broke. Oh no! So you know, and, and of course, uh, I spent my younger years in the fifties in Hong Kong when um, when things were re re well, fairly bad. Um, you know, things were quite poor, and we were living in around the Causeway Bay area where all the refugees were. You know, the whole shanty town, which is around the whole side of the mountain. You know, I remember when I was young that they actually had a fire in the yeah. so whole area. And then, those are those are real. I mean, that's why the book has such a resonance for people that actually have, have the origins there, because you can you can kind of reconnect some of your family history. And also, the second crisis was the 1967 riot. Mm -hmm. yeah. All these people were leaving, and my father decided to stay, and he said, "Okay, I've got to buy." So he bought property. Wow. <laughs> You know, so he, he did okay. He would be a rich man. <laughs> hey, but you know, at least, uh, and then of course he became a justice of the peace. That's what happened, that's oh. what happened to the Cassians. Yeah. 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 Everybody yeah. Right. Right. That's, that's how all the real yeah. company started. Right. Yeah. So I mean, it, it kind of connected me in all that kind of way. And what more more interestingly was, I spent most of my time in North America, and I was watching the, the consequences of what Hong Kong was doing, because in in 67, after 67, 69, there was a massive immigration, a wave of Hong Kong immigration. And it also was, uh, between here in San Francisco and here, it was the beginning of what we call the Red Garden Movement. It was a whole politicization of, uh, of the Chinese community. And, um, of course, uh, as later on I saw the different waves and how, how the, the, the Hong Kong immigrants were, were trying to settle and, you know, we start their lives over here. So for me, um, you know, all this is very, very interesting because, of course, later on uh, during uh, uh, the, the recent wave when, when, when the uncertainty about the Hanover, there's this, another huge wave. But in Toronto, it's very, very interesting. What I observed was that the wave, the very earliest wave in the early 1970s, because Toronto had such a small core of local born population that they were actually overwhelmed by the, the immigrant population. And in fact, it was the immigrant population that actually became politically charged and when there was a, a, a when um, CTV's W5 made a program that that uh, talked uh, that was insinuating that the Chinese were jumping the queue and everything. And it was the local immigrant Hong Kong community that stood up and made such a huge fuss that they were the first ones to actually hear the uh, the uh, major network apologize or something they did. There's only one thing that I, I feel um, um, that I, I, I wish they had, but you know, because I, I did, I, I'm doing a bit of study on the whole revolutionary movement, Sen it Seng and so on here, and I realized that on the whole, you know, these, these Chinese, um, you know, uh, banks as we call them, remittance houses, were a huge factor in the revolutionary movement, because they were the ones that were the conduits to make sure money was flowing, 
and so on and so forth. And you know that was you know uh, uh, you know. But hey, you can't write that all in one book. <laughs> we have the next one. I, th I, th I, th I think what the Stanley and Nicole have come as close as one can to write all of this in one book. <laughs> And for that reason, I'm deeply grateful to them, and I'm deeply grateful to all of the thank panelists. You. And yeah. we have some books at the back, which Jim is in. Right. Um, thank you all very much for coming. We could go on for hours, but yeah. unfortunately we can't, <laughs> uh, because this is such a fascinating topic. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you.